from him. And thank you very much, all of you out there in the wider world and those here today. I wanted to just start with a quick note uh, that most Americans are not familiar with the name Richard Kuglinski. They should be. Uh, he was a Polish officer and a hero of the Cold War who, at great risk, passed the American secret information about the Soviet plans to capture all of Europe in a World War III. Uh, this was information that President Reagan used in dealing with Mikhail Gorbachev in the final years leading up to the Soviet collapse with which we think the Cold War ended. Um, General Kuklinski was not an agent of American intelligence. He was a man of great courage who loved his country and understood what the real stakes were and did the right thing. Um, I invite you after this panel to have a look at the exhibits in the back of the room, which will tell you more about General Kuklinski and his heroic actions. I direct you in particular to the map with the planned locations of the Soviet invasion and nuclear strikes in the back over there. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us today the director of the Kuklinski Museum in Warsaw, Philippe Fronskowiak, who has come from Warsaw to speak to us today. He has a master's degree in international relations from the Collegium Civitas in Warsaw, uh, and is a former director, writer, and, and an author. Uh, please welcome Mr. Fronskowiak. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, for this conference uh, is the first uh, conference from the series, the Kuklinski Museum discussion series, co-organized by General Kuklinski Museum. Thank you, Minister Anders, General Cosentino, and Mr. Ambassador Rai. Thank you, Ms. Rosette, uh, for coming. We meet to talk about freedom, Poland, obtained it and reached for freedom 30 years ago. Then communism began to fall, but freedom is not given once for all. There are regimes that still want to regain freedom in the name of its imperial interests. What lesson comes from the 10-year mission of General Richard Kuklinski? It shows how together Poland with the US or US with United States with Poland, overcome the greatest threat of the 20th century, the Soviet Russia. Shows how close with the US, Poles want to be today. Because the lesson of fighting for freedom against regimes shows that they do not disappear. It, does, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, Tsar's Russia, Communist Russia, or even Putin's Russia. If we put a map of the nuclear attack, you can see it there, of the nuclear attack on Europe, which Kuklinski sent to the CIA, on the Moscow's military plans of today, it would turn out that only the technology changes, but the imperial plans practiced during military maneuvers are the same. It is enough to replace 1970 in 2090. We meet on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the death of General Richard Kuklinski. We decided to organize the Conference on Freedom in Florida because it was here that Kuklinski found his second homeland when he was chased by the communists of Poland and Soviet Russia after the death sentence. Here, on February 11, 2004, Kuklinski died in hospital in Tampa. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. I hope it will be a fruitful conference and hope uh, you visit General Kuklinski Museum during your stay in Warsaw. Thank you very much. Thank you. And welcome to the Kuklinski Discussion Series. Um, so here on the 30th anniversary of the fall of communism in Poland and at a time of immediate crisis in Venezuela and growing threats around the world, it's my great pleasure to introduce our three panelists. Um, 
I'm going to make quick introductions, and then they will each make brief opening remarks. We'll hold a conversation, and then open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we have with us today Minister Anna Maria Anders, who's come from Poland to speak with us, a Polish senator and Minister of International Outreach in the Polish government. Uh, her father was a legendary commander of Polish forces in the World War II Battle of Monte Cassino. Minister Anders was born in London, married a U.S. Army colonel, and has a son currently serving in the U.S. Army. Uh, our next speaker will be Brigadier General Tom Constantino, who has had a distinguished military career, too distinguished to name all of it here, spanning missions in Iraq with NATO and his 28th Commandant of the National War College. Uh, General Constantino worked with Polish troops in Afghanistan and was awarded a Polish medal for his work, his work with them. Today he is the Chief Operating Officer of BENZ, a nonprofit business enterprise, business, excuse me, business, business Executive. Executives, pardon me, my handwriting, not his problem. Business executives for national, secu for national okay. security. Uh, and the third speaker is Ambassador Otto Reich, whose family left Austria after the Anschluss, ended up in Cuba, and then came to the US when Castro came to power. And so he had a lot of experience and background in totalitarian regimes. Uh, Ambassador Reich has held numerous distinguished diplomatic posts, notably for purposes of this panel, as President Reagan's ambassador to Venezuela, as director of the Office of Public Diplomacy for Latin America and the Caribbean, under President George W. Bush as Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Envoy for Western Hemisphere Initiatives, and a senior member of the National Security Council. Today he is president of Otto Reich Associates. And with that, if I could invite our speakers to come up. Um, it is truly an honor for me to be in such illustrious company as my two fellow uh, panelists. 30 years since the fall of communism, um, I am lucky enough to say that I never knew communism. I was born in the UK. Uh, my father, General Anders, was not able to go back to Poland after the war. Uh, and I was brought up in a way that really, I think, probably uh, colors my view of the world today. Uh, my father spoke about Siberia, my father spoke about communism, my father spoke about the, what do you say, the shadow of Russia being over the world, and I think we see a similar thing today. Um, I now look at what is happening in Venezuela, and what is happening tends to happen here in the United States. I was reading today that so many young people uh, rather like the idea of socialism more than capitalism. And I think in Poland, what has happened is Poland is now a free country, but there is an incredible ignorance around the world of Poland um, during the war. Uh, as a, a Secretary of State in the Chancellor of the Prime Minister responsible for international dialogue, I travel a lot around the world, and people would say, why is it that there are so many people, so many Polish people around the world? We simply don't know. Uh, we hear about concentration camps, we hear about Nazis, we hear about the Holocaust, but not enough has been said about the deportations from Poland. People are agog when I tell them, over a million people deported to Siberia. We see what is happening in Venezuela now, and in a way it is similar to what happened in Poland, except in a very different way. Uh, the martial law in Poland at the beginning of the 80s didn't actually bring about a change of regime. That was much later. I think um, partially thanks to Bob John Paul II and, and President Reagan. Uh, and it's in Venezuela, we see the people fighting against socialism. And I think it's probably a good thing. It is a good thing because it will really show people who today in the United States are championing socialism, what socialism can actually do to a country. I remember going to Venezuela, to Caracas, in another life, in another job in the 80s. It was a relatively wealthy country, and uh, my fellow panelists, especially the ambassador, will be able to say more about that. It is now in shambles. So let it be a lesson learned. So thank you again for 
allowing me to speak. I look forward to a further discussion on the subject. Thank you. General. It's a great honor to be here, and it's a, a tremendous honor uh, to be hosted by the uh, General Kuklinski Museum. Um, I was asked to maybe give some thoughts on what lessons might come from uh, the fall of communism in uh, 1989 through 1991, and, uh, and how they might uh, reflect uh, on what is happening in Venezuela and Latin America. The, uh, you know, really uh, three things kind of come to mind here. Um, the first one uh, is the uh, is this story of um, what will the army do? And uh, I think there's a, uh, a hopeful lesson uh, that we'll find out very shortly. Uh, in, the, in the case of Poland, as a young officer s serving with American forces in Germany uh, during the, the late 1980s, we were quite confident that the Polish army would not support the Russians, that if war came, the, the army would revolt. And even uh, the imp imposition of martial law uh, was to us an indication that the Polish army was not considered reliable by the Russians, at least the Polish soldiers. Uh, you know, obviously there were members inside uh, of the uh, regime uh, that were in control, but the average Polish soldier would not turn on the people. Uh, in recent history, we've seen in Egypt, uh, through two revolutions, uh, first against Mubarak and then against the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, that the Egyptian army did not turn on the people. We saw a very different situation in Syria. Um, so I guess the question would be, what will happen in Venezuela? What will the army do? Uh, it's hard to say. They've had many years to purge the military that we knew uh, from the 1980s that we trained with as American soldiers. Uh, however, I'm hopeful when I see the stories about uh, uh, Venezuelan generals defecting to the opposition that there, there, may be, there may be truth in that. So I leave you with the first point being, uh, what will the Army do? Uh, our hope is that the Army will stand with the people. The second is uh, consistency in, and strength in U.S. policy. Uh, President Reagan was strong in his defense of uh, ideals uh, it, through the 1980s. The Russians knew, but more importantly, the Polish people and the people of the other uh, occupied countries knew that the United States was their ally and would stand with them and that we would keep the pressure on. Uh, I think today we are keeping the pressure on Venezuela. Uh, we have a clear and consistent message that this regime has got to go. And I think this, the strength of, uh, of American consistency is extremely important in being able to accomplish uh, a change uh, in, in the nature of things in Venezuela. And the last thing I would say is, as the minister pointed out, is this question of uh, socialism. And I'm actually very optimistic because I think that wherever social, socialism is tried, it fails. Uh, even, even the the, Scandinavian socialists are walking away as fast as they can from socialism because it's a failure. And so I think we have to trust, uh, have faith in God and trust in the fact that we come from a stronger and superior system and that our system is what will, in the end, a system of freedom, uh, of not only political freedom and, and, and freedom to speak your mind, but also freedom to pursue a living and own property and all the reasons why people come to the United States that the people of Venezuela, uh, just like the people of Poland, are going to want to have that same freedom. So I look forward to the conversation. And again, um, uh, it's a great honor to be here honoring uh, such a great man. Uh, our freedom is a testament to his sacrifice. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, um, Otto Reich, as Claudia mentioned, I was uh, 
the U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela under President uh, Ronald Reagan. I've had other positions in government, in the, in the United States government. Um, I'm also very happy to be here with my fellow panelists uh, to talk about the, uh, well, the 30th anniversary of the fall of communism in parts of the world. Uh, let's not forget that there's uh, communism still uh, about 125 miles south of where we are here in Cuba, and uh, there's another government in, um, or another regime, I should say, in Venezuela trying to impose communism there. And there's several countries around the world, particularly in Asia, that still are communist, and uh, um, some that are communist by other name. Uh, it is, uh, it's hard to believe that 30 years after the fall of the wall, that there are still countries that are trying to, that are following that model. Because it, it is a failed model and everything except holding on to power. The, uh, the Cuban government is an example. In 60 years, this month, um, the, the Castro regime, still controlled by the way by a Castro, Raul Castro, uh, who uh, theoretically left power last year but it was, it's, a, it's a ruse to try to fool uh, well-meaning Western liberals and the media. Uh, Raul Castro is still the Secretary General of the Communist Party of Cuba, which those of you from Poland and other uh, former communist countries know that it's the most important position in a communist regime. Uh, my, my father left Austria in 1938 as uh, Claudia mentioned, after the Anschluss, he, he escaped over the Alps, joined the French Foreign Legion to, to fight the Germans. The French surrendered. Uh, he managed to get on a Portuguese freighter. Portugal was neutral at the time, uh, and ended up in Havana, Cuba, uh, where he, of course, fell in love with the island, thought it was a paradise. It was prosperous. It was a, a growing country. It had all kinds of problems autocratic governments once in a while, terrible corruption other times. Uh, but it was, it was moving in the right direction under democracy and individual initiative until Fidel Castro came in. Uh, never said he was a communist. In fact, he said he was not a communist. Uh, I personally heard Che Guevara, I was 14 years old, when I, 13 years old, when I heard Che Guevara speak at a, uh, uh, at a park in Havana, I was there because my school was all taken there to listen. And he said, if I were communist, I would shout it to the four winds. And this is, one of, this is uh, you know, one of the most brutal Marxist uh, doctors who ever lived. He was a medical doctor who specialized in uh, putting people out of their misery by shooting them. Uh, th that's really the face of communism that uh, many of us here know, that Americans don't know, a lot of Europeans don't know, and it's the kind of education that I believe organizations such as this uh, should be commended for trying to, to give to the world today, when so many people are so confused about ideologies and about different uh, forms of government. Uh, communism uh, is, it, to me, is a form of, of, of totalitarianism that has to be removed from the face of the earth, and I hope that perhaps uh, we can come to, the, to a, uh, uh, a method, a solution in this, in this panel that will accomplish that. I have a specific question about Venezuela I wanted to start with, but after hearing your opening remarks, I want to start with something a little bit bigger, which is 30 years ago, we were celebrating the end of the Cold War, possibly the end of history, the great unrolling of a peaceful world. Um, and what comes to mind listening to you is Winston Churchill writing after World War II as he chronicled the events about how the great democracies in their, had allowed, in their unwisdom, had allowed the wicked to rearm. Could I ask you just in brief, how dangerous a situation do we face in the world today? Venezuela is the obvious flashpoint, but how 
bad is it? Should we, are, is the world asleep right now? And could I start with the general? Yeah. Well, big question. Um, so one thing I would say is, uh, you know, there are significant threats in the world. And the uh, bad actors work in concert often, which is something I think that we have to recognize that, uh, uh, you know, they're just like criminals work in concert, work against each other sometimes in concert at other times. So do nation states and, and transnational groups. The best strength to deal with that are uh, strong, sovereign countries that watch their own lane, like Poland does in Europe, uh, and that can cooperate with each other to stand up to these threats. Uh, and I like to believe still that the United States is the, uh, uh, is the leader of the free world, so a strong uh, uh, economic uh, and military and diplomatic power of the United States is, is essential. So working with uh, allies like Poland, uh, who are in defending their own sovereignty, I think we can stand up and meet these threats. So dangerous world, but the world's always been dangerous. It's just the technology has changed. Ambassador, if I could ask you where the current events in Venezuela, this showdown between presidents, the one the US now is recognizing and many of its allies are recognizing, and Nicolas Maduro, who has beggared the country. Um, how important in the scene that the general just described in the world how big does this loom? Is this a significant event in the way that the world is going? Well, uh, Venezuela is, is important, certainly for this part of the world. Uh, it, it represents a, uh, an attempt by, uh, in, in this case, actually even Russia and China to extend their uh, influence to, this, to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it is, it is, and obviously I want the current regime, the de facto regime of Nicolas Maduro and all of the people around him uh, to leave power uh, as rapidly and as peacefully as possible, in that order. Rapidly first, peacefully if possible. Uh, because they have destroyed the country. It's, I spent three years there, over three years. In the 1980s, it, it was an, it, an incredibly wealthy country. I mean, today has the largest reserves of oil in the world, the sixth largest reserves of gas. It has gold, bauxite, iron, everything you can think of. Um, and yet the people of Venezuela literally do not have enough to eat. And it's a result of one thing. And there's 20 years, only 20 years, of the rule of people who call themselves 21st century socialists. The, Hugo Chavez established something that he called 21st century socialism. And I, I said in my, in my public appearances that it was, uh, to me, it just was reminiscent of 21st century, 20th century fascism of the right and the left, um, which I think are basically just, you know, two wings of the same bird. Um, the, the advantage that we face today, I think, is that the the democracies of, the, of Latin America, for the first time in my memory, have come together to oppose the establishment of that particular, of, of, of that kind of a dictatorship. Uh, I mean, you can be cynical and say that it is because they are now feeling the, the cost of millions of refugees walking out of Venezuela, literally walking into Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, in some cases, a thousand miles, more than a thousand miles. But for whatever reason, they have decided to stand up and say, and say that the Maduro regime has to, has to change. In the past, all Latin American countries decided that sovereignty, quote unquote, which doesn't exist in Venezuela, by the way, because Hugo Chavez surrendered that sovereignty <laughs> to Cuba. Cubans basically run all of the power the important power structures in Venezuela. Um, so I think the, the, I'm encouraged by what has happened in the last few weeks for that reason, but, but it is still, it can go, it, it can go either way. And the, the wealth of Venezuela is something that both the Russians and the Chinese are very interested in acquiring. 
huge, the world's it's largest Putin. proven oil reserves. Right. I but and what, yeah. by the way, my, my, my feeling is that Putin would be very happy if the situation remained the way it is, because he doesn't really want Russia, I'm sorry, he doesn't want Venezuela to become once again one of the world's biggest producers of, of oil. 20 years ago when Chavez came in, they produced three and a half million barrels of, a day. Today they're down to one million barrels a day. Once again, socialism, Milton Friedman, the American Nobel economics uh, prize yes. winner said that, it, that if socialists were put in charge of the Sahara Desert very soon, you'd have a shortage of sand. <laughs> and I think right. Venezuela and oil proved that. And Minister, from Poland's experience, so many years of struggling to throw off the Soviet Union, of looking for ways of finally, at a moment that I think many people didn't quite foresee, uh, what is it that, the, what advice would you give now to the people of Venezuela? Well, <clears throat> I think the situation is very, very different. Um, uh, first of all, I think, um, I mean, the, we're all, everybody here is looking at it from the American point of view of as well. And uh, let me put on my Polish hat. And even though Please. I'm a, a US citizen, I will put on my Polish hat. Uh, Venezuela for us is far away. Uh, you know, it's something you see and it's like, well, yes, we experience it and it's really bad and, and so on. Uh, but Poland and Eastern Europe particularly are concerned with Putin. And you know, and uh, I think <clears throat> you ask about the dangers. You know, nobody really believed uh, how much of a danger Putin was until he took over Crimea. And you know, and I think um, as we look in the situation in uh, in Venezuela, I think it gradually came, and now we have this sort of um, this this drama. Is it a dangerous situation? I see it as a dangerous situation. They're not unlike um, other parts of the world where I feel that Russia, as the ambassador said briefly, uh, is meddling. Um, I think the greatest danger that we face in the world now is the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union and Russia. You know, it's if like- If I may, um, my understanding is that Venezuela actually is one of the, one is part of that. In other words, you have had the Russians, perhaps General Cosentino can speak to yeah. this. And but really that's what I'm worried that. about, is yeah. that I'm worried about um, undue involvement by the United States. I hope that we don't decide to go in militarily into Venezuela. Because I think that, and we know again, the general will be able to say more about that. Um, so I think from the Polish point of view, it's like I think we know, or the people who lived through the socialist times, communist time, know what it's like to live under communist rule. Well, if I could ask you all a, a question that's perhaps impossible to answer, but if anyone can do it, this panel can. Uh, in When there is this kind of revolt against a socialist dictatorship. There are factors that we now have many case studies that feed into it succeeds or it fails from Burma to China to Eastern Europe to and then going on to more recent uprisings which weren't really against communism but the Arab Spring and so on. Looking across all that with benefit of what we know today I uh, what is it that really could most matter here? Um, what is it that might tip this in the direction that the dictator Maduro goes and Venezuela has a chance? Um, any of you? Well, uh, you know, what I would say is, I went back to my first point is, you know, what is the, uh, where will the army end up in this? Are they gonna side with the people? Um, you know, unlike uh, in a case like Syria where there's, there was an ethnic division, you know, you have the, the, the Alawi and the Sunni and, and the Alawi kind of stuck with, uh, with the government. Yeah. Um, uh, so he always had a hardcore military uh, and supported by Iranians and Russians. Uh, in this case, you know, the, the army is the people. So where they 
his power is only going to last as long as they decide to stay with him. And so that would be the first point. Uh, second point is that it's very close to a failed state. I mean, it, it's, in, it's an ineffective state already. And uh, um, it, at some point here, I think it's more likely than any kind of U.S. intervention that we see a, a, a collapse. We're uh, talking about U.S. intervention here, but uh, quite a number of countries have now recognized Goido as uh, the legitimate president of Venezuela. Um, is it not possible that if we don't have the military ties to go in and try and bring over the Venezuelan military, that there are countries in Latin America able to do this, or even countries such as Poland well, that, in me, other words, are there intermediaries right. who might be able to help? Let, 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 let me address the fact that we're talking about Venezuela today, yes. 20 years after the establishment of, or the beginning of the dictatorship of, of a, basically a communist dictatorship. Uh, it started out very mildly so that the, the world would not be shocked like it was, for example, in Cuba that started very quickly with, the, with uh, firing squads and thousands of people being executed and tens of thousands jailed and hundreds of thousands exiled. Uh, but the result was the establishment of a, of a dictatorship and a military, the equivalent almost of a military occupation, a peaceful military occupation. In the Cubans have tens of thousands of military and civilians running uh, military communications, intelligence. Uh, Chavez and now Maduro's security, personal security, are Cubans, not Venezuelans, because they don't trust the Venezuelans. Um, they, they run the ports, the airports, the voting system, the voting roles. Chavez turned them over to the Cubans. Uh, so it, it's, in effect, it's hard to believe, because here you have a country, Cuba, 11 million people, bankrupt, and has been for a long time, like, you know, as, as you would expect from that kind of system, taking over, running from behind the scenes, a country of 32 million people that at one point had the highest per capita income in Latin America, Venezuela, and is now about the level of 80. It's almost a fourth world country. So it, it's, I personally believe that it's not necessary to have a military uh, a foreign military intervention in Venezuela. The Venezuelan people, by the way, are asking for it. Mm -hmm. They ask for it. Every Venezuelan who leaves Venezuela comes up and says, when are you going to send the Marines? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, let's, one of the reasons why we reach this point is because Western democracies, to go back to what Churchill said uh, in, 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 his, in, in his first volume of the Second World War, Western democracies did not say anything about the building of this dictatorship in Venezuela for 20 years, including a lot of the, the neighbors of Venezuela. They just turned their back, or they said, oh, it's, it's an internal problem in Venezuela. Well, it isn't, it, it, and we, we know that. We, we, we know from what happened in Europe in the 30s and, and, and in the 50s, and we know what happens in Latin, what's happened in Latin America. And the United States government also failed to act. The, Sanctions that we imposed last week that are fully justified on the oil company, PVVSA, which has been turned into a, a money laundering and, and uh, illicit crime operation by yeah. the Chavistas, should have been imposed a long time ago, and we probably would not have this government, that government today, cutting off the bridges for, from where foreign countries are trying to send food and medicine to the people, to the starving people of Venezuela. Um, you make me wonder, uh, where the, the news tends to focus on the, the sort of the crisis of the moment, Venezuela, but Cuba is clearly enormous in this equation. And then we move up Russia and China behind that. Um, would it make sense is, or is there anything we can do about the problem of Cuba itself, which is, National Security Council, advi National Security Advisor John Bolton pointed out a few months ago is part of this troika of tyranny and sort of the engine of it. Uh, what can we do about we, 
I include Poland in this question. What can we, the United States and our allies, do about Cuba? Well, uh, I have to say that um, I'm a little skeptical of the United States getting too involved in things around the world. Um, I worked for a number of years for on a Middle Eastern company. And I remember my boss at the time when Saddam Hussein was around and Arafat was around and Gaddafi was around. And he says, you know, you have to understand that the, there are certain countries that need a dictator. Now, I'm not saying that about either Cuba or Venezuela. But I think that sometimes uh, we can be a little naive. And I think really we have to see what the situation is before we sort of barge in. I agree with the ambassador uh, that I don't think that the US Army should intervene. And I, I think that I tend to feel that, the, that with outside help and humanitarian help and financial help, that the Venezuelans should be able to sort it out for, for themselves. Um, in the event that doesn't happen, I, can I ask our general here, what are the limits of soft power in a situation like this? Is it, is, is it something where you simply can leave it and hope that it will work out? Uh, well, or? It, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a little bit of a loaded question, Claudia, because, um, you know, we, especially coming out of uh, 18 years of uh, nonstop combat. So the United States, uh, I agree with the ambassador. I don't, I don't believe this situation warrants uh, uh, the U.S. military. I do think that if we have a total collapse in Venezuela, which uh, could happen and, and, um, uh, and the people could turn on those Cubans, especially since there's, there, there's nothing, they can't even eat. Um, if we have a major disaster, um, the U.S. would probably seek to have a, a Latin American face on any kind of uh, uh, humanitarian relief effort, uh, uh, or, or especially if the military was involved, although none of them could actually uh, get there and um, operate without U.S. logistic support. So, I mean, U.S. can't walk away from this. It's in our hemisphere. But a, a Yankee-led uh, operation in Venezuela is probably the biggest disaster uh, that you could have for us. So I don't think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the, the path that the ambassador just uh, described is the right path. Uh, continue to use the, uh, the, the rest of the levers of power and be prepared uh, to help save people if we, uh, if we have to in a humanitarian disaster. Yeah, let, let, let me digress, no, to disagree a little bit. I think the worst disaster is the status quo. Uh, a, a U.S. military intervention may be costly. Uh, I, I believe, I still believe it is necessary, but the, the worst scenario is a continuation of a government that has proven that it will turn its military on its people. It has killed them on, in the streets, in front of cameras. It doesn't care. Uh, it hasn't been the, the armed forces. It hasn't been the mm -hmm. Army or the Navy, the Air Force, or their, the, but it has been the, uh, the other. They have a gendarmerie called the National Guard. They, they will shoot people. They have shot people, killed them. Uh, I mean, in, 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 in broad daylight. Uh, same thing that's happened in Cuba. I mean, this is, uh, I don't know whether it's parsing, uh, you know, the, or trying to differentiate too much between one armed force or another, but we do know that some of these communist regimes have turned the military forces. They don't have to be communists. Saddam, mm -hmm. uh, Assad has done it. Saddam Hussein has done it. And Castro did it. Chavez did it. And uh, Maduro has done it. So I believe that if, if Maduro believes that there, will, there is no possibility of he being removed by force, that he will then stay using force and he will kill in very large numbers. He and the people around him. He is surrounded by people who have been charged with all kinds of international crimes, drug trafficking, money laundering, all sorts of illicit crimes. 
This is not a government. It's an organized crime entity that happens to have taken over a, a, the government of a country. It, it, very much like Cuba. Well, let me ask you about this. In the, again, on the world scene, um, we have a, an array of threats where many of them have a piece of what's going on in Venezuela, Russia, China, Cuba. There is something represented here that's <coughs> bigger than Venezuela. And sort of thinking back to General Kuklinski, who decided at some point, this cannot go on. I must act. Where, where does the United States, in this case, draw the line? Is Venezuela a place where we really do have to say at this point, it's 20 years, this has gone too far, whatever it takes, we can't let this proceed? Is that something where Venezuela should be <coughs> let it go, we should draw it somewhere else, the South China Sea, the Middle East, the where? Um, I'm gonna start with you and then if you could each Give a little well, I think my idea. concern would be, okay, uh, we get rid of Maduro. Do we know enough about the person who's going to take over? I mean, we are all saying, yay, you know, he is the, the, the new president. We don't really know what he's going to offer. It seems to be the, the lesser of the top, possibly the two evils, which has been the problem all around the world, you know, particularly in Syria. I mean, who do you back? Um, and, you know, it's like the... Um, uh, you want to get rid of the other regime and you're backing the people, the opposition, but you don't know what the opposition has to offer. So May I just ask you there, though, um, proceeding that way, you can end up with an enormous tolerance for dictatorships that finally oh, comes down to where it's yeah, dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm just saying a word of caution because with, you know, we're all going so enthusiastically for this other, with, with this other person. Uh, well, then let me ask you one more thing before I go back to our other two panelists on where we draw the line. And that is, if this succeeds, what is the most important thing that we should look to for rebuilding Venezuela? What matters to get it right? Well, I think economic aid, definitely, um, uh, above everything, and uh, medical I'm supplies. I'm going to ask again there of medical supplies, but after the immediate emergency care, Economic aid has a history of corrupting societies well, that... You know, then you do need foreign intervention. You do need somebody who is going to help the country. What I'm concerned about also is the, the thousands and thousands of people who have already left the country. I millions. mean, you know... Four it, million. Millions. Four million. Four million. Gosh, even more than, than I thought. I mean, it's, it's going to be uh, quite a challenge to, uh, to rebuild. Um, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. I mean, there I think that you yeah. do need, we do need all of us to, to, to do something to, to help them. Thank you. Okay, and if I could go to you on where we, is Venezuela the place to draw the line or someplace else? Well, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, the circumstances as we go forward. You know, for instance, uh, are there, uh, we've got this Cuban, uh, presence that's there in significant numbers. What we haven't seen is the uh, similar presence of Russians or other overt actors in the region. If that changes in trying to prop up this regime, I think uh, that will be a, a, a serious security concern that would be addressed pretty rapidly. Um, so that's the first thing. So we've got this kind of slow car crash happening in, in uh, Venezuela, if it hits a wall uh, with other actors coming in, I, I think that would precipitate a response. Uh, the second thing I would say is um, uh, I think we would uh, we'd have to see, even though the international organizations are not uh, the, the, the shine is off of them a little bit. Uh, I think we'd have to see some movement uh, uh, by the, the, um, the fr kind of the frontline states around Venezuela. Uh, more than just sitting back and saying, this is a terrible situation. I think that if they're looking for us to participate, uh, we'd have to see a real stand up uh, of, of others, because this is not gonna be in my view, uh, some U.S. unilateral action in Venezuela, absent uh, another actor, uh, a nation-state actor coming, coming
coming in at this point. So, you know, I, it depends. The ambassador talked about four million people spreading out across the region. It's having an impact now. There, you, we may actually see collective action here um, uh, over time to try to deal with this. Um, situations have, a, have a, you know, best laid plans usually don't work and they don't survive contact with the enemy. In this case, um, every day the situation is changing yeah. and um, we would have to deal with a, a, any kind of major um, uh, oppression or, or uh, 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 you know, genocide as the, if it happened the way the ambassador said it could happen. We, I don't think we would stand back and watch that. I do think, though, unfortunately, that this will continue on as a, as a slow-moving crash for a while. Well, um, thank you. Ambassador, I, if I can try and sharpen the question a little bit. Um, we, here is this revolt against a dictator where there's really no question that the man has ruined his country. They're destitute. They have inflation over a million percent, mm -hmm. which we don't even Basically, their currency is worthless, they have nothing to eat, and this is an oil-rich country. Uh, and at the same time, we have had these up or the Arab Spring, where I think Americans became very leery of doing too much and mm. worried about what might go wrong. And at the same time, here's this chance. Something has come along where they really are demanding a change. Uh, if America doesn't say, okay, we're really going to go to the mat, we're going to put this over whatever it takes, then where, again, do we draw that line? Well, I, I uh, as you know, I, I served President Reagan for eight years, and I remember, believe it or not, we forget, but a, a very similar uh, debate in the United States in the 1980s. Uh, there were a lot of people who were against rollback, uh, meaning, Reagan's policy of confronting the Soviet Union, bankrupting the Soviet Union, and ending the Soviet Empire. The State Department, where I served, some State Department official took out the line, evil empire, from Reagan's speech. And it was put back in by the political office of the White House. That was in 1983. In 1987, the State Department took out the line, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall and Reagan himself, in the car, on the way to the wall, put it back in. Those are just illustrations of the fact that there are always people who are concerned about, genuinely concerned about confrontation. But I think that the, the, the Western democracies tolerated the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe for way too long. We've tolerated the occupation and the, 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 the dictatorship of Cuba for way too long, and it has intervened, according to Castro himself when he was alive, he says he intervened, he supported what he called wars of national liberation in every country in Latin America. He said, with the exception of Mexico. He was lying because he was in Mexico when he said that. <laughs> so he, of course, couldn't admit that he had also intervened in Mexico, and we know he did. Uh, why, why did we tolerate that? Why didn't we draw a line much earlier? Actually, we did, and there were people who said, no, no, let's not do that. It's not necessary. It's not important. It's just a little, a little island in the Caribbean. Well, actually, until, of course, until the Soviets decided to put intermediate-range nuclear missiles in there in 1962, and almost brought the world to an end. Uh, th there are times when you just have to say, you know, it may be a small country, it may be a poor country, as Venezuela, unfortunately, is today, but we do have to draw a line, not the way that Obama drew the line in Syria, by the way. If we draw a line, it should not be erased. We have to, we have to. Thank you, I brought my family with me, so. <laughs> you have a great family. <laughs> Is this then one of those times? Is this such a time? I mean, that, I think that's one of the major questions about Venezuela now. There was a point where President Reagan just said, no, this cannot go on. Are we there? We have a very different world in some ways, and at the same time, there's Russia still at it. I was just there's to Cuba say. still with us. There's the rise of 
what we don't really call communist China right now. I think the definition, probably it would more closely fit the definition of something like fascist, if I, you're free to contest that if that well, sounds it's, wrong. It's Marxist, Lenin, Marxist uh, I mean, market Leninism. Market Leninism, it. exactly. <laughs> and at some point, we, you know, where do you pick the spot to take that stand and say, there's a chance here to, this can't go on. And I guess one of the questions, looking back 30 years and asking what are lessons we can draw, is have we sat a little too long and let these things go on? Because they're now becoming, I believe, compounding in the dangers. You have Russia and China cooperating, actually for years, on some of these things, at least in some matters that are quite dangerous or inconvenient to us. Uh, so again, to Venezuela, um, kind of a question of what's really at stake here. Uh, not only Venezuela, but um, the, yeah, the future of the world. How much of that is in play? Well, you know, I think as regards Eastern Europe, when the, uh, uh, the ambassador said we tolerated too long, we tolerated it because everybody's always been afraid of Russia, and, and people are still afraid of Russia. I think a lot of the world politics today are governed by fear of Russia all over the world, and it's indirect in Cuba, and in uh, in in Europe, it's it's very direct. You know, I mean, we're talking about possibility of permanent uh, uh, American base in in Poland, so it's it's very much it's very much there. If you could go back, speaking across 30 years, to America, Poland, all the countries involved in those huge events of 1989, what warning would you give them? What would you tell them to do differently with Russia? Well, you know something, it's, it, I, I think you have to go further back. First of all, you know, Poland should have never been divided the way that it, it, it was, you know? Uh, it, I mean, the lessons, you could really go back, you know, much, much further back. It was divided, and it was just sort of left, and, and, and the British government um, wouldn't even, I mean, we had the whole story of, the, of Katyn, you know, where uh, 20,000 Polish officers were murdered in Katyn in 1941, and the world wouldn't even admit it because everybody was afraid of Putin. And I think all that time, uh, we're worried about it. Here, again, we're worried about it because of you know, Cuba and, and this and that and the other. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how, how you get past this. The lessons that we, uh, that we learned, I think, you know, Poland had martial law. I mean, this when they when they, when it really the, when when the protests started to get really uh, really yes. strong, uh, but that didn't bring down the regime. It was it was outside interference. It was a strong person like Ronald Reagan who was able to do that. What we need today in the world is probably one or two really strong people who can really take a, a direct path and, and and make a decision. Well, um, if I can go back to you again, I. If this is something that's sort of in, hanging in the balance right now with forces behind it that are, have implications beyond Venezuela and Latin America, um, what is it, from looking back 30 years, what is it that on the larger scene should be done? If I could ask you again to sort of look at where do we draw this line? Where do we draw the line in the world today? I, I think wherever we have a very a, a serious challenge. I think, for example, uh, I think China is being uh, imperialistic in its in its uh, uh, takeover of the South China Sea. Uh, it you know it created artificial islands to say, oh well, those are our islands, and uh, uh, you can't come near our islands because or, or your or, or, or even uh, navigate near our islands. Uh, I remember when, and this is, the, this is part of the, the, the failure of, of, in this case, the United States, uh, which has been, you know, for many decades, supposedly the leader of the, of the free world, when Xi Jinping stood in the 
uh, the Rose Garden in the White House with President Obama mm -hmm. and said, oh, we're building these islands, but they will never be militarized. Well, he was lying. He knew, the, I mean, sure. he decided, th there's only <laughs> one leader of China, He's a comp and now he has m more power than, or as much power as Mao Zedong had. Well, if I can, if and we shouldn't this, have tolerated If this that. fails in Venezuela, if Maduro prevails and stays, does that send a message that creates much more trouble with Russia and China? I guess. If Maduro uh, fails? If, <coughs> uh, sorry, I'm sorry, no. If, if sorry. Guaido fails, oh. I, my, my apologies. If, if Maduro, Maduro remains, stays, I mean, yes. if the dictator stays in Venezuela, what message does that then send? And maybe. So let me back up your, your first point. Yeah. You know, how do you draw the line? Well, I think that you, you start by supporting your allies, the ones that are standing up as frontline states. In the case of Russia, that's Poland and, and Hungary and the other, the other uh, we have to, some of these states are waffling because the Russians are the power there. If we stand up, we, sh we support them, we show strength, uh, our allies will stick with us. So start with the frontline states. Uh, you know, we have a commitment uh, to Taiwan. Let's not uh, fail in that commitment. Uh, we have commitments uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines, um, other countries. You know, we should be Japan, South Korea. So stand up with your allies that are, are standing up as frontline states. That's the first thing. In the, in the case of, um, also I would say, in, in other places, Israel, uh, Egypt, people who are fighting today, fighting terrorists and fighting Iranian influence in the region. Be strong, as the ambassador talked about, President Reagan being strong. Back the allies who are in the fight with you. Second thing I would say is we've been down this path before. This is not actually anything new. We rolled back uh, uh, communist aggression in Latin America in the 1980s. And we started, and we did that by working with the, the, uh, the countries in the region that recognized that they were next. And um, so I, I believe that, that those four million Venezuelans are an opportunity, not a, not a disaster. And uh, we've, we've been through this before, we could, but again, it's good. I hope that those frontline states around Venezuela have finally woken up to the fact that they've got a real disaster on their hands. And if they have, and they're willing to work with us, uh, there are ways to uh, squeeze uh, the, the government of Venezuela without putting U.S. troops on the ground. And uh, we never invaded Nicaragua, but, they, but the, the regime fell over time. So we, we know how to do this. We forgot a little <laughs> bit. Uh, yeah, all we have to do is dust off the books and, and, and uh, bring out the lessons of the 1980s, and I think we can, uh, um, uh, we can bring a lot of uh, influence to bear. We never invaded Nicaragua, that's correct. I, I, and I, I was in the government at the time. Uh, we did support the Contras, right. and everybody was against it. The, you know, the, all the talking heads on television, the Europeans, and by the way, the European, the, a lot of the Western Europeans were against the Reag, a lot of the Reagan policies. There were demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of, of Europeans in every major city in Western Europe against the deployment of intermediate nuclear forces in Europe, which I believe now was a direct contributor to the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, we have to be careful when we listen a little bit too much to crowds. There's a, there's, there's a fine line between a crowd and a mob. Uh, in the case of Nicaragua, Reagan made a decision to support Nicaraguans who were willing to risk their lives for their own country. There are now Venezuelans willing to risk their lives for their own country. They have no guns. The, all the guns are in the hands of, of the military, the, 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 the de facto regime. You know, and, and as Chairman Mao said, power comes from the barrel of a gun. That's how they think. That's, and we, if we are going to help the people of Venezuela, we have to remember that they're completely outgunned. I mean, by hundreds of thousands to one. Mm. I have to tell you, in China in 1989, after the army moved in on Beijing and Tiananmen Square, Chinese citizens were saying to me and probably to other reporters, 
why doesn't the United States arm us? Yeah. We would fight this, and I wonder to this day <laughs> how that might have worked yeah. out. Um, I'm about to, we're about to open the floor to questions, so if you want to think on anything that you might want to ask. And maybe, I'm just, I'm inclined to say, okay, are there any lessons that have come out of this conversation? Um, my sense is that there's no great support here for an American military intervention unless Venezuela actually collapses to the point where it's, uh, somebody has to go in and help. Uh, but there is a definite sense that we do know how to do this if we go at it correctly. Um, and I, I don't want to read too much of my own opinion into this, but that it is important as the world is going to say there are places where we do have to draw a line and say, no, this cannot go on or continue. Uh, would anyone like to add something as far as what? Political mm -hmm. will, we need political will. What Ronald Reagan had was yeah. political will. He understood, he was criticized by a lot of people saying he was a simpleton, that he didn't really understand that he was a dangerous cowboy, he was gonna get us into World War III. Uh, he turned out to be right, and all of those critics turned out to be wrong. Uh, he in fact avoided World War III and liberated hundreds of millions of people in the process. He had the, 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 the political will and the vision to, uh, to support freedom. And that's, that's, that's what we need. Thank and you. I think, uh, you know, yeah. And I think actually coming back to General Kuklinski, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, uh, you have that person who, who can sees the danger and, you know, and he just, I mean, you know, he paid severely for what he lost two sons Afterwards, probably, you know, we don't know if they die under mysterious circumstances because the Soviet Union was not too happy of what he did. Uh, but I think it really doesn't take much. It takes, uh, it takes a person like Reagan, Kuklinski, uh, people that with real uh, charisma, real power, and, and really um, determination to do what's right. And we've seen, uh, I think, part of the reason that the... Um, the uh, Iron Curtain fell was the combination. We had a conference about this not so long ago, about the legacy of St. John Paul II and Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and even possibly Gorbachev at the time, who was perhaps less, you know, more Lenin than somebody else would have been. Do we have people in the world today that have the ability to pull it together? Okay, well, let me, <laughs> let me throw a firebomb into the very last minute of this, so then we'll, all right. We have President Trump, a very controversial figure in most political <laughs> discussions, and at the same time, he has been begun rebuilding the American military. He has begun saying there are places where we need to draw lines. He actually did attack chemical weapons facilities in Syria. He has done a number of things that say the United States won't simply retreat and invite other powers with you know, dictatorships to move in. Um, is there some chance that what he's doing, and right now you have an American government that has been, as far as we have seen, trying many things. The sanction, they have put the sanctions on the Venezuelan oil company. Um, they are trying in every way short of military intervention to support this revolt in Venezuela. So is there a chance, just in brief? I, well, I, I, again, I think we're too early in the, we're late in the game for the people of Venezuela. Yeah. We're too early in this phase to know exactly what's gonna happen. I, I, I do, I go back to my second point I meant, made, which is, uh, uh, consistency in, in American policy uh, now and strength is going to be key um, and also a degree of flexibility. I think we're going to have to uh, be ready to react to the situation as it, as it develops on the ground. Um, and I, I do think that these sanctions are going to have a, a, a bite very quickly and uh, unlike Nicaragua, as the ambassador pointed out, in this case, it appears we do have the uh, uh, Western Europe, the Europeans behind us, 
and uh, the, the frontline states around Venezuela are dealing with the Venezuelan disaster. So uh, hopefully uh, that will make the difference. And, uh, but we have to be clear in our messaging and as the ambassador pointed out in the minister, we have to show uh, political will and some moral courage going forward. If setting aside whatever anybody thinks about President Trump's personal style, yeah. if you focus on what you were talking about, what he has done, um, he's done what very few, no, no other president in, in, in recent memory, certainly since Reagan, yeah. has done. For example, in China, uh, the Chinese are actually very concerned. I don't want to say afraid. He has hit them where they where it really matters to them, which is their pocketbook. Uh, the, the Chinese economy is, is reeling as a result of, of Trump's sanctions or tariffs uh, and other measures that he's taken. They were stealing us blind in terms of military and scientific and, and business technology. I mean, they have an enormous espionage network trying to steal not just from us, but from the, from the Europeans as well. That's why the Chinese uh, Chinese science and technology seems to be so advanced because they've had to spend very little on research and development. They've saved a lot of money simply by, by robbing the West. So Trump is stopping President that. Trump, whether you like his tweets or not, is actually doing something That's about right. This. In Latin America, yeah. things have changed on, under Trump. And Venezuela is an example. I mean, the, 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 and, and Cuba is an example. The, the Cuba two years ago was receiving from the United States under Obama from this opening that was completely unjustified. Everything that it asked for, money, uh, remittances from the United States, tourists, what the, in exchange for what? Ronald Reagan would never have had that kind of, a, of, of, an, of an agreement with, a, with a, military, a communist military dictatorship off of our shores. Uh, Trump has turned that around, he just stopped it. They're, they're hurting. And, and other countries in Latin America have seen this. And a lot of left-wing governments in Argentina, in Brazil, in Chile, they, they, they've turned from, uh, they've been removed peacefully in the elections and replaced with conservative governments. People are willing now to give um, free markets and democracy a chance and they're, they're turning away from socialism or left-wing governments. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And now we'd be delighted to take questions from the floor. Um, yes? Can I ask you to turn that into a question? Yes. Well, Briefly. The, the, I'm so sorry. The, I, I, my heart goes out to you for expressing what you did. Um, and I think it's okay that I say this because we're in a free country. It's okay. But I wanted to say, do you see, any of you see any light where he may be able to uh, continue to make some accomplishments and, and powerful accomplishments in this world so that indeed we can have some peace uh, this is all I ask. Do you, do you foresee that in the future, where things will, will mellow out much more? Because otherwise, we're going to go the other direction, and it's going to be quite Thank hard. you. Thank you. Who would? I would like to maybe point something out. <coughs> um, Poland is a great ally of President Trump, a great ally of the United States. Um, I see a huge disunity, though, in what is supposed to be the European Union. Now, when we talk about allies, you know, uh, I attended a conference a few months ago. It was about transatlantic um, uh, relationship. And, uh, and, and I said at the time, I think 
I think I'm more concerned about the, uh, the European Union, which is um, right now having a problem, a major problem with, with Brexit. Um, you know, it's huge. Um, you know, Angela Merkel is leaving. That's huge. Uh, Macron is dealing with his gilet jaune, you know? And um, I think that's, that, yeah, I, I was just in Brussels a, a week ago, and I mean, they are slamming President Trump, absolutely slamming President Trump, you know? That it's, um, it seems to be, for them, it's either the European Union, I was telling Poland that they should be in the European Union and not an ally of Trump, basically what the conference is about. And I think this is a horrible problem as we go forward, other countries and situations are that, that the allies, so-called allies, are not united. And there's always going I to be- I seem to remember that when the Pershing missiles were put in, there was a certain amount of dissent at the time. Yes. <laughs> Is this chronic in Europe? I think, I yeah, I, I think I, um, I despair of the situation in the European Union right now. Um, you know, when people ask at the conference and they say, well, why do we want the U.S. forces? And I said, well, you know, something, I'd rather be protected by the 82nd Squadron than the French Foreign Legion at the moment, you know? <laughs> it's like, uh, So of you're course, here to seek asylum, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, of course we turn towards the United States. 1939, France and Britain didn't come to Poland's aid. So, you know, it's natural for us to feel more secure in the United States. But I think this, this choice here that we seem to find ourselves in, it's either America or, or the European Union, is, is very, very dangerous. Do either of you want to? Um... Well, to me, personally, yeah. per, per, I'm not, I don't care about the European Union. I'm actually an American citizen, yeah, yeah. and I like it here. Um, but what matters to me, having uh, spent a, a good part of my youth growing up there, my father served in, in Europe, uh, yeah. I served in Europe, um, uh, is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was never designed uh, for some sort of United States of Europe or anything else. It was designed for, by a group of sovereign states that got together because they had a collective threat. And, and that, that threat led to a collective defense organization founded first and foremost on the sovereignty of each country and then pooling our, our a military capability to defend against the Soviet Union. NATO still exists. We kind of have lost the, the message a little bit in the midst of the European Union. But I think for the United States, the key organization, we're not part of the European Union. That's not our problem. That's a European problem. What I think we're focused on and should be focused on is, is NATO um, uh, and uh, the message of, of having all the NATO states pull their weight uh, is an important message. And uh, working, you know, with a country like Poland, which does pull its weight, has I've served with Polish soldiers in Iraq. I've served with Polish soldiers in Afghanistan. Um, they're they're our ally, and uh, bilaterally, and we happen to uh, be part of the same collective defense organization. So, in my view, while I have nothing against the European Union, it's pretty irrelevant to me. Uh, I think we should focus as Americans first and foremost on our national interest, which is a strong NATO and with Poland and the other states that are frontline states, let's make sure that we are adequately supporting them so that we can do what we were designed to do as NATO, which is to, uh, to defend against a common threat. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. You wouldn't mind if you're willing to tell us where you, who, who you are and can't see you at all. <laughs> yes. I feel like I'm facing the Berlin Wall. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes. A uh, couple things ago, we were watching the, uh, the State of the Union speech, and uh, uh, during President Trump's speech about the evil of communism, many of our senators and representatives were being socialists or declared socialists. Right, we all saw that. Now, 
Let's take in Venezuela, uh, the scenario becomes really critical as far as you know, possible you know, martial law, concentration camps, you know, things like that, the dark scenario. Do you think President Trump will have support of the Congress in any sort of a military or even you know, serious humanitarian intervention in, uh, in, in Venezuela under those uh, circumstances? I was um, a little surprised to see, in, in, in answer to your question, when, when President Trump raised the, the issue of Venezuela very forcefully, uh, that didn't surprise me. But I saw some very liberal Democrats stand up and applaud. Uh, there were some, I mean, there's a group that didn't stand up and applaud. I mean, I think if George Washington had walked in, they would not have stood up and applauded. You know, they were just, they were in a very bad mood. They didn't want to be there. Uh, but I was, I was glad to see, uh, uh, you know, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York, who was, a, you know, who was running way to the left of where she normally uh, has been, or uh, Charles Schumer, uh, who's, you know, a, a liberal and also the, 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 the minority leader in the, in the Senate, uh, applaud the, uh, the, sec the, 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 the part where Trump actually mentioned uh, Guaido and the fact that the United States support that government led by, uh, by that young man. So um, I, think th I think there's support in the Congress for, uh, for more forceful action. I still hope, you know, a as a former paratrooper, that we don't have to send in uh, our, our young men because I know that there's plenty of Venezuelans willing to fight for their own freedom. Speak up, speak up for a little bit. I'm Brian Kramer from Boca Raton. Uh, and again, thank you to the panelists. My question, um, perhaps a double question. Um, a moment ago, we were speaking about the, the importance of being uh, participating in the European Union and the influence of the European Union. And I was wondering if the minister could address, or anybody can address, um, Poland's um, uh, feelings towards, uh, or outspoken um, uh, feelings towards uh, Donald Trump. Thank you. Understood. Would you like to feel that? Oh, it's a very long question. <laughs> um, so basically, going down, you you want to know whether po whether Poland could be used an example as an example for fighting, uh, yeah, like in Venice, Venezuela for democracy, or is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm saying. Okay. Is, is there really the, the right place to use it as a model? Okay. So um, we this question comes up all the time. Um, and uh, I am horrified when I hear people say that Poland is not a democratic country. So let me start off with that. Um, uh, first of all, if it were not a democratic, <laughs> if it were not a democratic country, first, first of all, our government was democratically elected, and that was really displeased the opposition. The opposition, the left, we see the same situation here in the United States, and unfortunately, most of the media tends to be more liberal. Uh, so we've had the heat from the very beginning. So I would say, first of all, you can read whatever you want. You can watch whatever you want. 
if it were not a democratic country, all those protests that you had, all those people would end up in jail. So that is nonsense. You know, Poland is very democratic. Uh, the thing that made it look non-democratic was we have had a few issues with the judicial system, uh, but people who don't know Poland and don't know the history of Poland and don't realize uh, that the judges that are in place, uh, many of them were people who were there during the communist times. And it was an effort to move them out. Now, whether it was done well or not well, I mean, I, I'm not going to be sitting here and criticize. I think it could be have done, been done a little bit better. But that does not mean that the people are not free. Um, I think in, the, in Europe, um, I mean, I think the one thing that the Venezuelans can learn from the, from the Poles is the tenacity, the wonderful tenacity of the people, the courage, and you know the way that they, all those years under communist rule, they survived. The Catholic Church was very instrumental in that. The Catholic Church really gave the people courage. Uh, they had a common sense of purpose. Venezuela, I think, if the people can hold it together and they have the courage, and I think it's probably also a Catholic, Roman Catholic country. I don't know how far the faith goes there. Um, but the situation is, is infinitely worse than it was in Poland when the, when the communist regime fell, infinitely worse, because Polish people were not starving. They were under communist rule, but they were not starving. And this is a dire situation right now. Um, and then you had another part of the question, I think, but Poland versus the European Union. Um, yes, we have an issue there because the European Union thinks that we are relying too much in the United States. That's what the general said, he doesn't care about the European Union. And I think at the moment, we are having a problem convincing our opposition that we do want to stay in the European Union. 82% of the people in Poland want to stay in the European Union, but they don't want to necessarily follow the bureaucracy that the European Union seems to be bringing on. And that was the prime reason for Brexit in the, in the first place, was the, was the rules. When the European Union first, first started, they didn't have all these rules. Now they seem to be interfering in the uh, policy of all the other European countries. Um, and I think discriminating against certain, I think, for example, you know, it's, when you see Angela Merkel and Macron sitting together and they are, you know, forming their little treaty when the situation is really, you know, not, not that positive in either country at the moment. And they're clamping down on Poland. I think basically the greatest problem right now uh, in the United States and in uh, countries like Poland where people are striving to put forward a different point of view is the media. It seems to me that nothing positive, particularly in Poland, I am saying all over and over and over again, I would like to see some positive narrative about Poland. I would at least like to see something positive on Poland on page one of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Something positive is on page 10. Something negative is always on page one. And we're fighting this all the time. And I'm horrified when I see the same thing happening here. The lady said, um, the ambassador said, the President Trump has done so much good. You don't hear that. You're always hearing the, the, the negative part of President Trump. So I'm sorry I'm bashing the media, but I really think that yeah. it's a huge if, problem. If, if, I, if you want to see the New York Times say something positive about Poland, all you have to do is get President Trump to attack Poland. <laughs> yeah. I assure you, the New York Times and the Washington Post and all the networks the next day will be going to Poland and trying to find all the good things, the nice things to say to prove President Trump wrong. Can, can, can I just, uh, so one, one thing I would say, I'm not going to comment on the media or, or the politics. What I will say, though, is um, if we look and can, uh, identify pretty firm evidence that the Putin government in Russia tries to interfere with our elections and sow dissension between uh, people and, and parties in our own country, how much more so do you think they're doing 
in a, in a state right next door that used to be their vassal. And, and, and it, it's not surprising to me, uh, shortly after um, uh, President of Poland and Prime Minister Netanyahu talk about the possibility of, of major uh, both defense uh, sales and uh, natural gas sales doing business that, uh, you know, a, a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, neo-Nazis pop up uh, uh, making noise about Poland and, 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 uh, and the Jewish community. So I would just say, I would take, you know, media aside, politics, Democrats, Republicans, I, I don't go there, but I do know Russians and I know the Russians have been actively working against our country, and they're actively working against Poland, and they're actively working against Israel through Iran. And uh, so these are threats that are common. And if you, if, if you take what you see with a grain of salt, is all I would say. Thank you. Why don't we take one more question? Uh, yes, sir. Ambassador, I think this is one for you. Well, uh, first, a, a couple of reasons. Um, one is it does not fit the mainstream media narrative. Uh, the mainstream media in the United States completely bought the, the line, the Obama line, that the Cold War was over uh, with Cuba, that uh, you know, it was time to reopen relations. And it's very hard for them to then say, oh, but wait a minute, they completely manipulate, not dominate, but they manipulate Venezuela. The media has finally, after many years, frankly, of defending Chavez and saying, oh, he's just a misunderstood land reformer, which is what they said about Castro 60 years ago. The media have finally realized that, that these people are bad who are running Venezuela. And if the Cubans are with them, the Cubans must be bad too. But they don't spend any effort, any resources trying to find out what the Cubans are doing uh, in Venezuela. The other aspect is that the Cubans have become very, very good at hiding what they do. They don't do a lot of this stuff in, in public. They, for one thing, the Cubans look very much like the Venezuelans in many cases. Uh, the Venezuelans have changed all their military uniforms to look like the Cubans. And it's very hard to tell who's Cuban, who's Venezuelan. You can tell by the accent, if you know. Um, you know, that the Cuban accent is different from the Venezuelan accent. But most American journalists don't even speak Spanish, so it's very hard for them to, to differentiate. Uh, but there's no desire to, to support, the, once again, the narrative, let's say, of the current American administration. They, they don't want to, I was joking about, obviously, when I said to the minister that if she wants the New York Times to say something nice about Poland, get Trump to say something bad about Poland, and the New York Times will immediately say something nice about Poland. <laughs> it's, 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 it's reactive, and the, what your, your question is, it's the opposite of that. The, the media are not talking about that. They should, um, because a lot of the problems, in, I mean, most of the problems in Venezuela today derive from the fact that, that 20 years ago, Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro sat down together and said they were going to do what we're seeing now in Venezuela. They're both they're, dead. They're right side of the spectrum in the media does not talk about what you're saying, personal involvement of Cuban personnel surrounding. The right wing? You don't hear it from Fox News. You don't hear it from uh, Trump. You don't hear it from the administration. Neither side is not making well, it. No, it's true. It's not very well known. I mean, I know it because I was ambassador to Venezuela. I talked to Venezuelans every single day. I talked to Cuban defectors. Uh, and actually, it, has, it, it is reported. It is there. In, in many cases, it's, cases, it's a, a more specialized medium, uh, a, a more specialized medium. Uh, it's not in the 
in the daily in the daily press. But you know, you'd be surprised. I just saw uh, there was an editorial by Jackson Deal in the Washington Post this week that talked about the Cuban presence of Venezuela. The Secretary General of the Organization of American States, uh, Luis Almagro, who is a, a leftist or Uruguayan, has said that Venezuela is under military occupation by Cuba. I mean, that's that's like the. He's the equivalent, let's say, of the Secretary General of the UN, but for the Western Hemisphere. So there, there are people addressing this issue, but you're right, it's not sufficiently reported. So people are addressing this? Because what you said, you mentioned the Secretary General of the UN, but Washington Post is considered extremely uh, liberal. That's why I used it as an example, that even in the Washington Post, there, there is one, one columnist, he's a columnist, he's not a journalist. The Journal has reported it. Mary O'Grady in the America's Column comes out every Monday. She is very, very good. She covers Latin America as well as anyone in the, uh, you, know, I, I guess, I say, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal is the mainstream, part of the mainstream media. You have the Wall Street Journal News Department, which is left of center. You have the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is right of center. Uh, so I guess they balance each other out. You have to read both of them. May I, may I ask you one thing related to all this? And then we'll close this out. But I, I have the sense that this is a country, America, where for all the alarms and so on, people basically feel pretty secure that we're kind of asleep to the degree of threats that are again gathering. If you read accounts of the 1930s, there's a lot that sounds alarmingly familiar. Yes. And I do wonder, before the media, I mean, what they're saying is, saying is correct. The Wall Street Journal's editorial page has had some material on this. You will find it if you look, but there's not a lot out there. You're right. But before, Finally, real attention is turned to these things where it's not just a sound bite. You know, here's the um, insurgent, sort of the, the person, the Democrat of the hour in the country of the hour, and there's America backing him, which is sort of the simplistic news headline. Before we really get attention paid to the things that matter here, what is like, what does it? What has to happen? I mean, it took Pearl Harbor for Americans right. to pay attention to what had happened to Poland. Because it affected them. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so unless it affects Americans directly, perhaps. I mean, Venezuela is that relatively close, you know. At least uh, Europe is, is that much further, so you may have a little bit more. But, you know, I always look at this uh, from two points of view. Now, th President Trump says, make America great again, okay? And I, as an American, as well as a European, have felt all over the years, uh, living in Europe, that America was not appreciated what they were doing around the world. It was like bashing the Americans was like a hobby, you know? <laughs> and the amount of money that we're putting into helping other countries, and they hate us in return, I have a son in the U.S. Army. I mean, I, you know, I have to look at this now. Do I really want my son going to save some country here that in return is going to say, say that they hate the United States? It's, it's very, very difficult. And I think that's what probably drives other people here is let's, you know, let's not do too much. I mean, we're secure. It's, it's not our problem unless it becomes our problem. Maybe, thank you. And could I just ask you each in brief uh, sort of to, to comment on the same scene? Uh, you know, how big a warning or an alarm are we seeing with Venezuela? Is it something where we can say, okay, you know, d poignant moving, but if it's I think we should send Octavio Cortez, what was her name, uh, the new <laughs> Democrat, send her to Venezuela and let her look and see what socialism is like. Send a few of these new, fresh Democrats and send them over to a country to see what socialism can really do. Because that is the thing that really annoys me right now, that there's people who are clueless. 
she had an interview with somebody, and they say to her, well, you know, what, what, what do you consider a socialist country? She talks about Sweden and Germany because, because, because they give freebies to people. I mean, this is just unbelievable. The, the ignorance, we have the most intelligent people in the world in the United States. We also have the mo some of the most ignorant people. I actually meet people who don't even know that Germany invaded Poland in 1939. You know, I mean, send history back to universities, to schools. You know, how can we possibly get our young people inspired if they don't really know? You have to learn from the past. I could see sending a congressional delegation to Venezuela as long as they have to shop on the street. Um, <laughs> anyway, if well, you, if you well, two would I like would just, to. I, I, would, I wouldn't characterize the American people as asleep. I think we're non-interventionist yeah. by nature, and, uh, uh, but American people are anteing up $750 billion a year Tonight, there's 200,000 Americans moving in all directions That's around I the world. That's too much, and not so, appreciated. So I, I think we're, we're, we're pulling our weight, and uh, uh, just because we don't want to rush into um, uh, conflicts around the world doesn't, I don't believe that we, this is not 1939 or 1941 in the United States. Uh, the, the, the people, the American people, in my view, you know, the average, I grew up in New Jersey. The average guy in Jersey wants that $750 billion spent well and those hundreds of thousands of Americans on watch. He just doesn't want us to jump into the middle of somebody else's fight necessarily if we can find another way to accomplish the mission. Thank you. But your, your, your comment about the 30s is, is valid because, uh, and, even, and even 41, uh, I mean, in the, in the 30s, there was a, a tremendous debate all over the world about what to do with the, about the rise of fascism. Nobody thought that it was going to affect their country. And even as late as 1941, as you know, our Congress passed the military draft by one vote in the summer of 1941, 40 or 41. Uh, the, until 1941, we were selling the Japanese scrap iron and oil. And the Chamber of Commerce was lobbying for it, saying, if we don't sell it, somebody else will. Well, the Japanese returned that scrap iron to us, as we know, just a few months later in December of 41. Uh, and that's when, that's when Americans wake up. We, we really do, unfortunately, not pay attention to threats. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm generalizing. Uh, the, the vast majority of the people do. They want to be left alone. And, or they follow what George Washington said, stay away from those European, he said European conflicts at the time because that was the only continent that he assumed would, would be of any kind of, of threat to the United States. Um, our, the, the times that we've had to enter wars that frankly were started by other people and, to, and to, to stop them, I think changed, should have changed our attitude towards these threats, and they have. This is why we built the, the most powerful military in the world, so we wouldn't have another Pearl Harbor. Instead, we got 9-11, you know, things changed. We still have threats. We have to be constantly on the alert and prepared, and you know, we will always have these debates, I, I, I believe, as long as we're a free country, but I would l really like us to be a little bit less naive Sometimes we're naive about the threats uh, and more willing to confront them before they become a crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your marvelous service to the free world over distinguished careers for a wonderful discussion today. And thank you very much to our audience. Thank you. Thank you.